All right. Hey. Thank you, everybody. It's Las Vegas, and we're talking about ethics, so thank you all for coming. So, um, so today is the last day of school. Last day of school for anybody else got kids? Last day of school. So I have, um, I have two teenage daughters, and I find that um, they tend to listen to a lot of AI these days. They listen to Alexa. They watch Netflix, they're, they peruse, and they'll tend to listen to the opinions of a lot of artificial intelligence. Um, at the sa other side of the coin, um, I am an idiot. Um, and, then, and then I also have my mother, who has gotten a new car recently, and um, she claims that the GPS is lying to her. Anybody else have a mother whose GPS is lying to them? So, you know, this is the world that we are living in. And so, you know, just setting the stage for, you know, why are we here today and why are we talking about the ethics of artificial intelligence at this particular meeting? Um, you know, last year at this time, I went to my nephew's graduation. He was in Boston, and I was... Uh, with my brother, and my brother is actually a neuroscientist, he's a professor, and he insisted that we go to the MIT Museum because uh, he wanted to see uh, an exhibit there. There was um, a famous neuroscientist, no longer living, who had apparently drawn all these designs of brains that were really beautiful, and he wanted to go see these. And as we were walking into the museum to go see these designs of these beautiful brains, um, we were walking in, and there was a, another parent, a, a man, who was walking in behind his daughter. And just as my daughters were running ahead to go, there was all, of course, it was the MIT Museum, so there was all these robotics exhibits. And the little girl, she was probably about eight, who was walking in with her father, was similarly excited to see all of these robotics exhibits. And as we were walking in, the father saw all these robotics as well, and he said, you know, robots must exterminate. And the little girl squealed and ran away from him. And I was thinking, you know, well, how is it that we have formed these opinions of robots? And it's because, I think, of all of the books and the movies that we have seen, right? It's The Terminator, The Matrix, iRobot, uh, you know, it's uh, Transformers, and of course, one of my favorites of all times, Blade Runner. Is that anybody else's favorite? And so, with the generation of AI and this data explosion that we're living in, I think it's time that we start to tell another story. And, you know, I really believe that automation and this technological revolution is really about how AI and, da and data are really enhancing the human experience. It's not about how AI is ruining our human experience, it's about how this can enhance our lives. So I think it's really about how all of us are here because we wanna tell another story. So as some of, us in our company are saying these days, trillion is the new billion. So we have today three, more than three billion smartphones, eight and a half billion IoT devices, and in the future, by 2035, we believe there's going to be a trillion connected devices. So why does ARM care about this? You know, with the growth of AI, intelligence at the edge, ARM is really going to play a critical role in this world. We're going to play a critical role in the future of artificial intelligence, and therefore ARM, I believe, and we believe, has an obligation to be talking about what role AI is going to play. And we're going to lead and participate in the discussion of ethics. So about two years ago, we were sitting in an executive committee, and I asked, would anybody be interested if I started a discussion in a working group 
around ethics and artificial intelligence, and there was sort of this exuberant reply, yes, we'd be very excited. And I thought, well, well what sort of unicorn company have I joined where everybody's really excited about the general counsel talking about ethics? Um, but I was delighted. Um, and I think we all know and agree that technology is always going to move faster than regulation. It's just always going to move faster, and it's very difficult for regulators to keep up with technology. Technology is always going to be at least you know, 100 steps ahead. And one of the interesting ways I believe that ethics can play a role is because we can also always agree that one person's ethics is not the same as another's. So when you think about culture and the role of culture and the view of ethics, and particularly if you're sitting in an environment Las Vegas, um, you, you have to have a discussion around sort of where is this moral compass? Where does, where does it all sit? Um, and when you're looking at the role that artificial intelligence plays in it, it's all about that design code. And we're gonna talk about, you know, how can we address this as a community? Uh, so one of the things that I believe and why this is such an important discussion is because as we think about the design and as we think about the role that ethics can play, ethics is going to lead, and the discussion around ethics is going to lead ahead of regulatory affairs. And obviously, I don't think you can control artificial intelligence purely by a discussion of how regulation can control the design. We're always going to be behind in regulation. I think regulation has a role to play, and certainly we're seeing that already if you think about data privacy and GDPR and harmonization around data privacy regulation with GDPR, but if you look at what's happening in the United States, you have the California regulation, but you're not gonna have a regulation in every single state and think that we're gonna have some harmonization around how to manage data um, with a regulation in every single state around data privacy. But if you look at how can we ethically manage how data might be used, that's a completely different discussion. So, Culture will create a diverse perspective, and how do we implement globally? That's going to be an interesting discussion if you think about how different cultures can come together to talk about some of the key issues, and we're going to talk about some of that today. So it's not about answers. I'm not here to propose that I have all the answers or that anybody has all the answers, but what I think when you get together with the technology community and you think about how we could have an iterative discussion, that's going to be an interesting debate. Um, and I think that you could have some influencing behaviors if you get the technology community together and you start to have an influencing discussion. All right, so the fifth wave, right? We started with the mainframe computer, and then you had computers in the home, and then you have the internet and cloud computing. The fifth wave is now we have this data-driven era where you have IoT that is generating data, you have 5G that is transporting data, you have machine learning that is processing this massive amount of data. And that is just going to be this massive force where data is going to continue to generate at massive speeds. It's like a transformation that we've never seen before. We are already doubling the amount of data every two years and that is only going to continue to exponentially grow as IoT grows in our community. And this is going to dramatically increase what, as we see this trillion device world, right? So it's going to be something that we have to continue to manage, and as, that, as, as we get into the world of 5G, it is going to exponentially increase, and it's also going to be incredibly personalized as we bring this into our homes more and more. So I'm gonna share a film. This is called Good in the Machine. Has anybody seen this film? So this is one of four films. Um, this is the third in four films. The fourth is actually called Ghost in the Machine. It's available on YouTube. This is just an excerpt, a very short excerpt from the film, but it gives you a taste of some of the ethical considerations that I'm gonna talk about today. I encourage you to go online. It's all available publicly on YouTube. Arm was one of the co-producers of this film. Um, it really covers a broad range of some of the considerations. Again, this is just a very short expert, uh, excerpt from one of the four films, um, but I'll just give you a little, little taste. I've long thought that artificial intelligence was maybe the most plausible candidate for a development that could fundamentally change the human condition. 
I think more profound than the Industrial Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution, maybe comparable only to the rise of Homo sapiens in the first place. This machine learning technology going into almost every device. They're being used in transport, for healthcare, for predictive policing, financial services. It really is at that explosive early stages of technology development. A lot of sectors are being disrupted by those new technologies and therefore posing new digital ethical questions for society. AI is going to be an extremely powerful tool, so what worries me is what people are going to do with that tool. Many people are very concerned about uh, lethal autonomous weapons. We would have to have serious questions about allowing a machine to decide what is morally right or wrong. We get our values from many different sources, from parents, teachers, society, our culture, religion, but machines, they don't have any of these things. He does look almost kind, doesn't he? That doesn't mean to say we don't want to put any values in machines at all. I think we'll need to. AI is exciting and frightening at the same time. It has massive potential to actually improve our society, but it bears also a lot of risk. AI is inherently opaque, hard to scrutinize and difficult to understand. So and if those so-called black box systems are making decisions about us, the need for accountability is even higher because we don't really know what's going on in that magic little black box. We ought to make this transition into the machine intelligence era, but, but it, I think, behooves us to be quite careful about how we manage, not, not to just to stumble into it blindly. One of our priorities at CFI is the value alignment problem, which is the problem of making sure that machines that make decisions do so in a way that aligns with human values. And as machines become more powerful, this becomes both more important and potentially more difficult. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> but it also then raises the question, well, if we're aligning machines with human values, well, whose values? It's not like all humans have the same values. Ethics inform our laws, but they don't make them. So social mores develop in society. We come to a loose agreement that this conduct is bad or that this conduct is desirable. But interwoven into our laws is an implicit assumption about what is right, what is good, what is moral, and what is ethical. Isaac Asimov's book, uh, I, Robots, a collection of short stories. And in the short story Runaround, he for the first time writes out the three laws of robotics. He writes about robots finding ways around the rules again and again because the three rules were never enough to completely encompass the thinking process of that machine. The concept of right and wrong are very human concepts. The machine, if you like, is choosing A or B. It doesn't understand the consequences of a decision to really know right from wrong. That's why it's important to really understand who's the agent that is writing those, those, those policies. My fear is that the technology that we're building will be shaped by corporate and political entities that human beings don't control. If we go straight for controlling the AIs, we'll miss the big picture. I think there is an even larger upside in terms of going beyond the human condition as, as we know it and unlocking ways of enhancing human experience, improving human capacities, creating new modes of civilization, if, if we get it right. So that gives you a little taste of the film. I definitely encourage you to watch it if you find that interesting. Um, all four of the films are actually really interesting and help form the debate. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite a fascinating set of, of instruction around the kind of thinking that you see on a global basis. Um, I find them quite interesting. So now, of course, when you think about the world's most popular device, it's the device that we all hold in our hands every day, the device that I can't pull my children's face away from, and that's the smartphone, of course. And that is where we all find the power of learning every day. And right now, of course, I mean, this is where ARM, you know, really made our mark. And it's where we find more intelligence going into that device every day. And it's also where we find the digital divide um, being broken. Because even in the third world, that's where, you know, you may find people that 
aren't buying shoes, but that smartphone is going into their hands every day and more knowledge is going into that phone every day. Right now, one billion ARM-based smartphones have machine learning fingerprint sensors in them this very day. And more intelligence at the edge is going into this device every single day. So phones are using AI in all sorts of clever ways and will continue with 5G to continue to use AI in ways that we haven't even imagined today. So this is continuing to be the world's most intelligent device and will continue to be the world's most intelligent device and is also being used by our children and in all ages the most intelligent device today. So whether it's speech recognition, facial recognition, and more intelligence every day going into this device, it is going to be something that we continue to acknowledge being uh, the kind of device where intelligence at the edge is going to be used more and more. But of course, AI is nothing without data. So intelligence is everywhere. And with IoT and with the evolution of more robotics, this is really catalyzing the, the spread of intelligence everywhere. So the AI revolution is really just getting started. We're just starting to learn where AI can enhance the human experience. And while much has been said about AI in the cloud, the revolution is really just beginning to happen at the edge. So there's billions of tiny moments happening at the edge every day. So data that we've seen from the IDC suggests that 324 million edge devices are used in some form of AI, both from inference and from training. So do you remember the first day that you went from one device and you were maybe doing some shopping or looking at something and then you went to another device and all of a sudden you saw what you were shopping for and it showed up on that other device and you had to go back to that other device and make that reference and think, oh, that was really, that was really creepy, maybe it was an accident. Uh, and then you realize, no, it wasn't an accident. It, it really happened. That's something that you were looking on in one place. Your, your privacy was invaded, and it showed up someplace else. And then maybe a year later, you moved from got, getting used to that experience and that inference, and then you were offended that maybe that inference was actually saying, well, why, why, why would they think that I was interested in that shopping? That's not my style at all, right? So we've gotten used to that inference and you know, that training, going from you know, training to inference. Um, and that invasion from one place to another, and that experience has, we've gotten used to it, right? So the things that we get used to in one place has now gotten, you know, it's part of our everyday experience. So, you know, at one point, this smart AI has got, you know, where we once thought it was something that was kind of creepy is now just part of our everyday experience. Um, you know, we've gotten used to the fact that we're using these IoT devices, maybe it's your, Yuffie or your robotic, you know, uh, robot vacuum in your house, um, knowing that this pieces of data are being collected about us every day. Um, but, you know, that is just part of everyday life now in terms of how these edge devices are collecting data about us. And when you think about it, that combination of edge and cloud information is just a massive explosion of data. That inferencing we are now experiencing, we're estimating that now there's 3.7 billion units um, that are collecting data about us every single day. So here's an example. So when I was growing up, my father was a doctor and he carried one of those little beepers. You know, he was just this nice doctor and he was used to chaos because he was an OBGYN. And I always thought that he was sort of just used to the chaos. I used to go to the hospital with him. Um, you know, because babies come at any time of day, and he was just this very calm person, but I would go to the hospital, I thought this was just this chaotic environment, and I remember him saying that, you know, the, the, the magic really happened with the nurses, because they were the ones that were going in and out of the rooms, and they were taking care of people, and they had the clipboards, and they would pass him the clipboard, and that's where all the data was, right? So he would write something down, but the magic was all in these clipboards, pieces of paper, and when he get beeped, you know, he, somebody would call him, and he would be beeped on his beeper and he'd have to rush back to the hospital. Um, and I even was a, a candy striper one summer and I, I lasted about a month because it was just far too chaotic for me. And you know, this was, this was the world of the hospital and it, at some point finally when he retired he said he was just tired of too many people with clipboards telling him what he had to do. Well, the world is changing, right? The world is going digital, 
fewer people are running around with clipboards and the, the, you know, there's more information that's going into computers, thankfully. Um, but you know, this controlled access to, to hospital rooms is still something that hasn't been perfected. Well, ARM is actually doing something really interesting. We're partnering with the Great Ormond Street Hospital and we're actually working with them to have devices on cameras that are controlling and taking facial recognition software and looking at who is going in and out of hospital rooms to help understand how many times people are visiting patients, understanding if a patient is in distress and understanding what that patient looks like. And that data is all being collected in a really positive way to understand how patient care is working. So no more are people having to check in at a desk or um, write down how many times a person is being visited, that data is actually being collected to help with patient care and understand how well a patient is being cared for. And that's really a powerful piece of information to help doctors and hospitals understand that a patient is being cared for in a really positive way. So that's something that really checks in a, in a, in a really data-driven way um, and it can be really powerful for hospitals to understand how well patient care can be collected and, and, and understood. There's other ways as well that AI data can be used in healthcare, and healthcare is I think one of the most positive ways where that patient care and human interaction can be something that enhances the patient care experience. So here's one, Respiro Smart, Mo Smart Module is one. So when I was growing up as well, my brother was an asthma sufferer, and he used to always have to carry around uh, one of those puffers. Anybody else suffered from asthma or know somebody that suffers from asthma? So it's actually a really scary thing. I remember several times when he had to be rushed to the emergency room. And it's really a very familiar kind of condition. It impacts millions of people. The WHO actually estimates that 250,000 lives are lost due to asthma conditions. So the inhalers are actually a fairly low-tech device. Um, and they've been used for years and years and years. Uh, but the interesting thing with Respiro and this technology is that using an AI device, not only can you track with children even, and very young children, how many times they need to use the inhaler, but how they're using the inhaler. And it gives doctors and parents information that helps them understand the, the efficacy of the inhaler. It helps them understand how much medicine is going in. It helps them understand the depth of how that inhaler is being used and, um, and how much medicine is being used. So it's actually saving lives. It's giving really critical medical information and is really not necessarily such high tech information, but it's, it's an amazing tool. And it really shows how machine learning and this kind of fairly low tech kind of information can save lives. So in the future, this could also be used with low, low air quality. Um, it could be used when there's more pollen in the air and things like that. So it's, it's really quite remarkable. Um, Amico is the uh, company that's been using this. And you can imagine the other kinds of applications that something like this could be used with machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's other kinds of concerns that go along with artificial intelligence. So I think it's really important to talk about the advances and how AI can be used for good, but also the concerns. So the black box is really the representation of the things that people are concerned about with artificial intelligence. It is the very representation of what is it that I don't know. The black box is a closed system. It receives information. It puts out a result, but you don't know what happens in the mystery of the black box. It's like a person's brain. I don't have to tell you what, you know, I can tell you what my opinion is, but I don't, tell you how, I don't have to tell you how I got to that opinion. Um, so it, acts, it gives you no clue as to the why or the how. So it's very reasonable that people, humans, would have a mistrust of this black box. It's not unlike the black box in uh, a flight system, but with the black box we know in the flight system, people can go back and they can understand the flight recording system, they can understand what people said, what happened in that. So what should we be afraid of? What is the innovation around that? And when you think about innovation itself, it's that marriage of science and imagination, right? So are all the movies wrong? Are all the things that happened in The Terminator and The Matrix or Blade Runner, are they wrong? What should we be afraid of? And how can we address this 
through the framework of ethics or regulation, and that's why we're having these kinds of conversations. So it's easy to see why people are forming a negative view, and the conversations that we can have today can help us address that. So ARM actually did some research on some of the perceptions and these negative concerns. Some of the concerns said that 75% of the people that were surveyed um, said that autonomous vehicles could be hacked. 85% um, of the people said that a a AI machines being hacked for the loss of personal data was a major concern. 57% of the people said that AI machines are becoming more intelligent than humans. And 60% of people said that criminal use of AI technologies was a major concern. And actually, that concern was not unfounded. Um, so there was actually some research that was done that said that AI could actually spear fish faster than humans could. So some concerns are not entirely unfounded. So when we think about AI for good, like Respiro, there's really a tremendous amount of opportunities for AI to do good. And I mentioned the medical field. Um, AI is actually being used to analyze imagery for Alzheimer's patients. Some of the outcomes for that said that um, physicians were actually able to diagnose Alzheimer's patients 10 years earlier than traditional methods. So that gave uh, physicians 10 years of opportunity uh, to give uh, diagnoses and to treat patients. That's really a remarkable number. We know that it's being used in diagnoses for, for tumors, for cancer. So lots of, of tremendous opportunities in the medical research fields. And there's lots of companies that are being formed now to use AI to enhance what's being used in the medical field. So I think just tremendous opportunities there. So we also did a survey of the technology industry around professionals and particularly around security. Um, and as we know, um, security is fundamental if we're going to allow for trust in AI. Um, security is fundamentally important. And 70% of the, those surveyed said that, yes, we absolutely agree security is fundamental. Interestingly enough, though, people said that only 25% felt it was good if it didn't add too much cost or complexity. And this is always one of those fundamental things that's interesting in the security field. Um, as somebody who worked for 20 years in cybersecurity before I joined ARM, I always find this to be particularly interesting. Um, so people are saying absolutely security is foundational, it's important, but as long as it's not too complex and as long as I don't have to pay for it. Um, but you know, if anybody's going to trust AI, it has to be secure. Um, and of course, in the world of data privacy, so privacy won't work if you don't have security as a foundational aspect of that. So I just think that's always going to be interesting. And if you're developing AI, you have to have it secure as a foundation. So of course, bias is um, one of the major issues in AI. I think everybody has heard about some of those nightmare stories where um, those who didn't invest in addressing bias as a conscious effort or as an unconscious effort. We know about the human issues with bias. Um, there were issues with uh, facial recognition and not recognizing humans, and so there were issues of facial recognition, and, and um, the face was either recognized as an animal um, or a gorilla. Um, there was a, a, an Asian uh, camera rec uh, company that um, didn't recognize Asian eyes and thought people were blinking. So that again, sort of, you could just presume that was an unconscious bias. Um, so there was a, a company that recognized Native American garb as being costumes. Obviously, significant issues um, of um, issues w w where there's racial accusations that cause significant brand issues for those companies and that had to be addressed. And of course, when you think about the issues that companies face in addressing bias, conscious or unconscious, it, it's the same kind of thing when you're thinking about it as an engineer and addressing bias in the machine. Um, the ways that you would address those would be having a diverse workforce addressing those kinds of issues in the machine, making sure that you're consciously addressing that. But it's a very complicated issue. And sometimes when you're designing bias in the machine, um, sometimes it's intentional. There's cultural issues, so there's bias by region, there's bias by race. Um, uh, bias can be a legal bias issue, it al also can be um, just a cultural bias issue, but it's an incredibly important issue, and whether you're dealing with bias in the criminal sanctions area or you're just dealing with it in terms of social issues, uh, it is something that in order for AI to succeed, 
it's going to be an incredibly important issue to address. Um, so there's also an element of humanity. So if you think about how bias is being addressed in courtrooms, people aren't sure if they can trust bias in terms of criminal sanctions issues because of that humanity issue, which is quite interesting. So can a machine have empathy? Probably not, but would you trust humans to be more empathetic? Is that the right thing to do if you're just trying to have an unbiased opinion? It's quite an interesting issue to address, I think. Um, it, it, you know, in general, humans aren't quite ready to allow a machine to just make a decision because of that humanity and empathy, and yet, in total, uh, a machine could be more unbiased than a human. So it's, um, it's one of those really interesting debates, I think, that we're having today. The other types of issues, and this is something that RM stands very firmly behind, is transparency and accountability. Um, we be, believe very firmly that you should be able to explain the decisions and to be transparent about those decisions. There are, of course, some nuanced edge areas where perhaps transparency isn't the right thing because if you think about sort of the criminal sides of areas, you wouldn't necessarily want to explain some, to somebody how to get around the law and, and be able to be transparent about that. So there could be some slight nuances there. But fundamentally, being able to explain how a decision is made, and that goes back to the black box decision, uh, is the right thing to do. You want to be able to explain the algorithm, be able to explain how it's made, and ultimately that will go to the next discussion point, which is liability, fundamentally, particularly in America, but it's more of a discussion and debate um, that comes to the liability discussions. Who, who ultimately do you blame? Um, which is a very passionate discussion, particularly in America, but it is, again, more of a decision um, and a culpability question that comes around in Europe, and there are some regulatory issues that are coming out there as well. But fundamentally, if we're going to trust, and that is ultimately how we all want to get to that next decision, if people are going to uh, buy AI or be able to uh, incorporate AI into our solutions, um, you want to be able to get that trust into the, into, the, into the system, and ultimately transparency and explainability are going to have to be um, part of that solution. So it's going to be incredibly important. And also, if you want trust that it goes to the end solution around AI for good, if you want people to believe in it, you have to believe that it is a good solution. So liability and insurance, um, we tend to think about self-driving cars, of course, so uh, hence the picture, but it goes into just about everything when you think about an AI algorithm. Um, the AU is starting to look at liability, so there's the product liability directive um, and fit for purpose kinds of decisions, but this is incredibly important um, when we're thinking about our final solutions and AI solutions. You're thinking about <clears throat> individuals, manufacturers, you know, ultimately if we're going to have people coding for AI solutions, um, engineers are going to want to make sure that they're not ultimately liable as well, so there's going to have to be some kind of codification around who ultimately is to blame? Do you have to have some kind of solution around um, what is the right codification around how we're designing for AI? Who signs off on it? Um, can you have insurance around AI? Um, this is going to be um, a key issue for everyone. <clears throat> and then, of course, the jobs and economy. This is something that everybody cares about. People are very concerned about whether or not AI is going to displace humans. Now, I mean, I think ultimately, when you think about transformational technologies, you know, people will say, well, the world doesn't need more ditch diggers and there's always going to be a next job. I do believe that AI will transform technology and it will transform what we're doing today, even in my own profession. You know, when you do research, 80% of legal needs are not met today. So do I believe that lawyers will be doing the same jobs today as a result of AI? No, I do not. Right now, we already know that AI is starting to transform how contracts review is done, how due diligence is done. So maybe the value of what lawyers are doing today will transform. Maybe we are not going to be paid the same. Maybe the jobs that people doing coding today is not going to be the same as what they are doing in the future. Maybe the world will be more of a caring community because AI is going to be doing different jobs. So those of us will ha that are doing 
certain jobs today will have more time to think about how we're caring for others. Because AI is going to be helping doctors with some of the analysis that they're doing, doctors will have more time to take all of that wonderful knowledge and they'll be able to care for patients in a different way. I'd like to think that AI is gonna take all this wonderful data and is gonna help us to be better thinkers and be able to think about how we're taking all that wonderful data and do different things in the future. Maybe there'll be a different divide in how this you know, community that we live in today um, you know, we'll be spending our money or earning our money. Um, but I don't think, and if you've, it was an example around um, banking tellers, that ATMs were gonna completely displace banking tellers. And in fact, the, you know, the banks found that they had to hire more people to be tellers because ATMs were drawing in more people into the banks and they needed to hire more tellers. So I do think we have to think about the future of STEM and how technology is changing. And I do think there is an obligation between companies and governments and society to think about how are we retraining people as a result of AI. But I don't think that AI is going to completely displace the need for technologists and lawyers and coders. Um, but I don't think we can sit back and just wait for it to happen. I do think that um, we have to be involved in that. I also think we have to teach ethics to engineers and to be thinking about what is our obligation as a result of issues around bias and issues around um, the development and transparency as a result of what AI is bringing to our community. So what is the role of government? Some of the interesting things that I've learned when you think about AI is that government plays a different role in technology in different worlds. So when you're in Western society, government is often the first to use and will validate. So we talk a lot about trust in AI. Well, the government is the first to trust technology, right? So they might invest in research. In other countries, government might be investing and buying, so investing in companies and in, buy, in buying. So in, in Eastern society, there may be more government investment in specific technologies. In the US and the UK, um, the government is gonna question those technologies. They might invest in research, and then they might be the first to say, I might test your technology. And then once I trust it, other commercial companies might then buy that technology. Um, but the government has a role, to, I think, to play in regulation for sure. The government has a role to play in research. Um, the government has a role to play, I think, in this dialogue, right? So I don't believe the government should over-regulate because that will quash the innovation. So right now, I think GDPR is playing a role in harmonizing regulation and data privacy in Europe. I think if every state tried to regulate data privacy in the United States, we would never be able to roll out artificial intelligence in the United States and we would lose. Um, but I don't think that not having data privacy regulation is the right answer either. Um, so there has to be some regulation, but I do believe that if companies come together and talk about what is the right ethical framework, not that we will have one, but if we ha say, look, Addressing bias is important. Addressing transparency is important. Addressing how we're going to roll this out. And ARM has a working group, and we have come together and created a manifesto that we would like to talk to other companies about, and possibly even a code of practice for engineers. Um, I don't necessarily think there's one size fits all, but I do think that there are certain issues like bias and transparency and addressing the black box that are really important. And talking to government, talking to society, talking to companies about these kinds of things that there is an essential role that we should all be talking about. So in summary, um, three big points to maybe take away is that I do believe in technology for good. I do believe in AI for good. So I think solving society's biggest problems through innovation and collaboration is something that companies can work together. And I think AI is absolutely a big revolution. Along with this revolution of data, there's going to be an explosion. There is an explosion. Um, and AI, along with 5G, is going to be a major part of this, and we should all be paying very close attention. The AI augmenting the human experience is something that I believe strongly in. So planning for jobs in the future with ethical AI is something that I think is very possible and should be something that we should all plan for. So I think there is a future for jobs for everyone, and I don't think they will be the same jobs, and maybe there is a future for the caring society that will be something that we could all be very excited about. 
and doing good is good business, so I believe ethics are good for, good for business. Not having ethics is not good for business, so you take the counterpoint. Um, so it's good for business, it's good for society, and government should absolutely have a part in working together. So thank you all for coming out and participating. Do go look at those films, I think they're wonderful, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>